Welcome, one and all, to the Leafline Podcast, episode 28. You might be aware from our previous podcast that my co-host, Brian of the Ralston, is spending some time back east in Pennsylvania. So I was very, very fortunate that I was able to schedule such a high-caliber replacement. I would like to introduce my wife, Kristen. Hello. Uh, Kristen will be joining me, not for every segment of the show today, because there's some of them that are boring, um, but I'm, I'm very interested in her thoughts on our main topic today, and we're very interested in your thoughts as well. So if you have anything you'd like to say to us, we love getting email at centenary1911 at gmail.com. On to updates. I'm still distracted by the fact that I waved when I said hello. That's definitely staying in. Oh. <laughs> can I get an update? Yes, you can get an update, and for once, I've got a lot of stuff to tell you. Uh, Family Movie Night is going to be October 9th here at Centenary Church. This podcast will release on October 8th, so if you happen to listen to it on Thursday or Friday shortly after it's released, you can still show up for this thing. It's going to be 7 p.m. on October 9th on the Centenary campus. Uh, bring a chair or a blanket to sit on, and like all... Um, on-campus activities that we're hosting. We thank you for wearing your mask. And you can start showing up within 20 minutes of the event beginning to make sure you have time to get through the protocol station and uh, find a nice spot for you and your family. So I really genuinely hope to see you there. Two days after that, this Sunday, October 11th at 5.30 p.m., I am excited to say we finally have our outdoor worship events in the making uh, this first one will be a modern worship sing-along. It's called Sky Songs, October 11th, 5.30 p.m. As before, bring a chair or a blanket to sit on. Thank you for wearing your mask. Check-in starts at 5.10 p.m. And we'll be playing some preludes. Some We don't have time to do all of our songs within the, 50, the 30 minutes that are allotted. So we're going to be packing out the prelude and the postlude with other beloved songs. And um, worship itself, the the official event will start at 5.30 and end around 6. RSVPs are extremely helpful to us because we don't know how many people are going to show up. And if we get RSVPs, we might know that we need to schedule multiple events that same evening. We might have one start at 5.30 and then the next one start at 6.30 just to make sure we can accommodate everybody that wants to be there. And the outdoor hymn sing will be coming up on October 25th, also at 5.30 p.m. Again, Bring a chair or blanket to sit on. Thank you for wearing a mask. Check in and our the preludes will start around 5, 10 p.m. The official song sing-along will start at 5.30 with a bunch of traditional hymns. And again, RSVPs help. If we see that 30 people are going to show up and we got RSVPs for 30 different people, we'll probably have a second one that very same day just to accommodate everybody that wants to be there. Those are your updates. I've been Ben. You've been lovely. Moving on. Recommendations. Give it a try. So we are now on to recommendations. Our audience hears from me every week. Kristen, what have you been reading? What have you been watching lately? Well, I just started reading King Lear. Like all the cool kids do. Right. By Shakespeare. Um, it's not exactly one of the fun plays, but it's very interesting. It's fascinating. So I'm, uh, that's what I, yeah, I just started that one recently. Um, I do have a couple of actual recommendations. I'm not going to recommend King Lear. Give us some for real. Give it a try. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you some actual recommendations. Um, I recently read a book called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. The subtitle of that is Discovering the Grace of Lament. And the author is Mark Rogop. Vrigip. <laughs> That's V R O E. It'll be written in the description <laughs> below this video. You <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm not quite sure about that. Um anyway, the book obviously discusses suffering and struggles, but it kinda of, kinda of does throw does so through the lens of lament and how to use lament as a companion to walk with you through grief. And I like this book because he defines lament as um, a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Okay, so this is faith-based. Yes. Okay, cool. Probably should have started out by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would have been that interested in, 
hearing, yeah, about it otherwise. But yes, yes, it's about biblical laments. Cool. And he analyzes various laments from the Bible, such as Lamentations. Oh. Yes. The Book of Lamentations and, and various Psalms as well. And he uh, uses them kind of as, as guides for Christians right. to um, walk through grief. And not just rush through it, but to really use that as an opportunity to know God and develop faith. So uh, that is an excellent book. I strongly recommend it. Sick. <laughs> I do have a second recommendation, which is a little bit more cerebral than the first one, but it's a very beautiful book. It's Confessions by Augustine. So um, Augustine was a uh, fourth century saint who lived in the Roman Empire, kind of the later days of the Roman Empire. And um, this is his autobiography, and I like it because it's written as a prayer. I've never read anything like that before. He's writing the story of his conversion, and he's addressing the whole thing to God. Hmm. And he's talking about he's talking to God about seeing him work throughout his entire life and bring him to a place of acceptance of the gospel. And one of the most famous lines from that book um, is, The thought of you stirs us so deeply that we cannot be content unless we praise you, because you made us for yourself, and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. You've probably heard that somewhere before, I'm guessing. Um, but uh, that's that's an it's a very philosophical book. It's best read in very small snippets. Mm. But it's um, another. So it's not a page turner. No, no, not at all. <laughs> but I would say it's well worth reading, especially if you're up for a challenge. You want something uh, very complicated, <laughs> but it will take you uh, pretty far. Okay. Um... I've got a give it a try as well, but I think we'll hold it for next week so we can get on moving with these segments. And if you're interested in any of the books Krista mentioned, there will be Amazon links in the description below this video. Krista. Yes? Oh, what are we moving on to? Uh, well, didn't you just hear the song? We're raising a glass. Oh, okay. Yes. Do you have anything you'd like to raise a glass to this week? I actually do. Um, I really enjoy this segment that you and Brian have added recently. Um, so I, what I'm going to raise my glass to is something um, that I miss as a congregant. You have both spoken about what you miss as ministry staff. Oh, I like this. So mine is probably the most generic thing that a congregant would say, but I'm sure everyone would agree with me. Um, I just miss going to church. I miss mm. sitting in the sanctuary and um, standing in the sanctuary. <laughs> I miss um, seeing my husband lead worship live. I miss hearing the sermon. I miss taking communion um, with a body of believers and um, all, just all those good things that I had completely taken for granted. And I was used to them being part of weekly life. I really miss them. That's a wonderful answer. Don't you also miss incidentally seeing somebody? Yes. There's no, oh, hey, there you are anymore. No. Like, if you no. want to see a human being, it is by careful deliberation most of the time, unless you manage to recognize them under their mask at the grocery store. Yeah. Emphasis on the careful. It requires planning and, yeah, you, you don't just run into anybody anymore. But at any rate, that is a wonderful raise a glass. Clink, clink, here, here. Clink, clink. Trivia. Now, I am excited to announce that one listener did answer the musical theater question from two weeks ago that um, we did not get an answer for last week. Here was the question before rocketing to superstardom writing songs about stray cats and opera ghosts. Andrew Lloyd Webber debuted two consecutive Broadway musicals inspired by biblical events. Name those shows. I should point out that... My wife did know the answer to those. She just, she's not competitive at all. So she didn't email them in. Would you mind telling us the answers? If I can just tell you verbally, why should I email them in? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You want to tell? Oh, sure. Um, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Debuted in 1968. And Jesus Christ Superstar. 1970. The listener that wrote in about that was Mr. Jeff Jacobs. It's good to see him back on the trivia 
The second question was uh, in the category of sports things. The 1989 Battle of the Bay saw a lot of stars of California baseball colliding. Will Clark and Candy Maldonado of the Giants. The Oakland Bash brothers, McGuire and Canseco. But the A's had one particular athlete that was set apart not just for his fine mustache and mullet, but his sidearm pitching style. Who was that man? The answer, Dennis Eckersley. Joyce Uziak, good to see her back on here as well. She got that one correct. And Jeff Jacobs, even though 1989 was uh, a few significant years before he was born, uh, he did point out in his email that he is the one centenary Oakland Athletics fan. So thanks, Jeffrey, for writing that one in. For this week's trivia category, we're going a little bit weird because there's twice as many Akinas on here as usual. So we are giving you three questions in the same category, and the category is Brian Scott Ralston. So we all love my co-host on this podcast. Now we get to talk about him behind his back. Question number one. For years, Brian has been attempting to extend his birthday celebration beyond a simple day. What is the goal duration that Brian is trying to extend his celebration toward? That is question number one. Question number two from my wife. What is Brian's nickname for his home state of Pennsylvania? Mm. And question number three. Brian once convinced a member of one of his Bible studies, that the Apostle Paul had a dog. What was that dog's name? You can send your questions, your, sorry, your answers to centenary1911 at gmail.com. Please send them in before Tuesday at 9 a.m. to make sure that your name will get read on the show. And you get full credit for being as brilliant as you clearly are. On to the main topic. Story time? On to story time? Story time! Because the lockdown is boring. This lockdown sure is boring, isn't it, Kristen? Very boring. Do you have a story for our audience? I have an entertaining and embarrassing story about something that happened to me. Who is it embarrassing for? Me. Okay, go for it. <laughs> okay, this happened probably about ten years ago. Is that right? <laughs> I'm trying it to remember. It must be about 10 years ago. Yes, because yeah. you were there. You were very much there. Um, this happened up at Shaver Lake. My family has a cabin there, which... Pray for Shaver. Side note, the cabin has so far been spared from the fires, so we are very grateful for that. But uh, we were, we've been up there many times over the years, and one of, on one of these occasions, we were walking next to the lake... I am a very short person, so most of my pants are too long for me. I was <laughs> just just put that out there. I was wearing long jeans. She's got were, a lot of frayed cuffs in that closet. Yeah. I mean, I try rolling things up, but you know they were dragging on the ground, and uh, we were walking, you know, among dirt and rocks by the lake. We weren't on any stepping over trail. logs. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I suddenly felt something on my leg, something crawling. I felt. Uh, skittering skittering yes that's a great word i i didn't i was envisioning a weird bug so i felt i felt legs for sure tiny little legs and so i i stopped and froze and said ben there's something in my pants and didn't you kind of brush that off uh i wasn't very subtle about brushing it <laughs> off i was i was prepared to treat you with incredulity like like it was Victorian times and the, the, the vapors had gotten to you. <laughs> okay, sure, Kristen, there's something on your leg. Yes, I needed smelling salts. Um, so, but when I stopped, I stopped feeling that movement, the little skittering. I felt very correct in that moment. <laughs> so I kept walking. I thought, okay, I must have imagined it. But I felt it again, and it was in a different area of my leg. Slightly northward? Yes. And I suddenly became very alarmed, and I stopped short again. It said, I think there's something in my pants. For context, we were standing right next to the lake. It was a very broad, open area. Even though it's the forest, it was not a heavily treed area. Yes. Yes. 
There were boats out on the lake. Yes, there were definitely boats out on the lake. Not too far away from us. But Kristen, you had a proposed solution in that moment for what you were certain was a creature on your leg. Yes. An insect of some kind. I unzipped my pants. And when I saw her reaching for that and she was announcing her intention, I was like, Kristen is a very, very modest woman. Oh my gosh, there's a creature in her pants. <laughs> and as soon as I unzipped my pants, a lizard leaped out of my pants. It was more of an eruption. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, Kristen, did you know there was a lizard in your pants? She yes. was very gracious to not say I told you so. I was too shocked and surprised that that was actually what was in my pants. It was a lizard. It was a lizard. A lizard in her pants. It was revolting. Although, on reflection, it was probably more scared than I was. But I didn't scream. Right? I screamed, I think. <laughs> I don't remember. You made sort of, you got very rigid and your hands started <laughs> waving around in little stiff circles. And I think it made a noise like, ugh. Yes. I think I was too surprised to have the air necessary for a scream. You made a mummy noise. <laughs> a zombie noise. Yes. Main topic. So we are now on to our main topic. Kristen and I had a lot of discussions about what the main topic could be. We struggled with this... We started thinking about different things that she and I could geek out about, but we ultimately settled on something we hoped listeners might find a little bit more interesting in the vein of our son. So if you've seen us around Centenary Church, you might have noticed that our son doesn't look a whole lot like us. Uh, he was, in fact, adopted. Um, and we are going to have a discussion today about what the adoption process has taught us about how God himself adopted us and just kind of having in our lives this very visual, very tactile metaphor for what uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about in his various writings. This one, for instance, uh, should definitely be considered in this discussion. Romans 8, starting in verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Now, that's a very common phrase that we use in Christianity, but I love that Paul gets a lot more specific here. He's not using that term ironically. He says in 15, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. And Kristen, you've probably heard in church sermons before that there are multiple Hebrew uses of, you know, the, the, the word father. Yes. And uh, what do you know about the word Abba? That it means daddy. Yeah, it is. This is a very, very informal version. This is not the term for heavenly father. It's it's Papa. Yes. I want upsies. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 16, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Paul's not leaving a lot of room for uh, interpretation here. He's being extremely specific, and I think that's helpful in this. And before we continue with this discussion, we got three points that we want to make, but I do want to point out that both Kristen and I feel very awkward because in this metaphor, we are comparing ourselves to God. But uh, we want to point out that our reflections on what adoption has taught us about being children of God have actually been extremely humbling because it casts into sharp relief just how often we, as human being parents, do not measure up to God's patience and persistence and the unconditional love that he's displays towards us. So, yeah. Right. Yes. Well said. Right now, we are both thinking about our failures as parents just today. <laughs> yes. It's like a movie playing back in my head. Okay, so... Um, shall we move on? Yes. Point number yes. one. Um, when we were in the courtroom and a judge was reading out the stuff from the state of California that she has to do to make the adoption process official, uh, I don't remember her specific phrasing. I really wish I could. But she said this thing about the fact that our boy, who in this conversation we refer to as David, for anonymity's sake, um that he would be an equal heir with any other children we might have as if he came from your body. Um, and that was so telling to me. In the eyes of the state of California, he is our biological son. And yeah. that was a really 
rubber hits the road kind of moment for me. I kind of got chills thinking about that, but it also sort of brought me back to Romans eight seventeen. Um, again, language is getting very specific. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Like the idea that if we did have biological children at present, David would be completely equal with them in, in a legal sense. And that, that was just such an amazing moment for us in the courtroom. And it really helped us to get a grasp on these passages in Romans 8. Kind of an, oh, that's what God is talking about. Um, and that was just very, it, it still kind of boggles my mind. Kristen, do you have anything to comment on that? Yeah, I, I remember that moment very clearly as well. And she asked us, it was almost like it, when you do your vows at a wedding and you have to hmm. say, I do. Yeah. So you're making that public commitment. And she asked us outright, do you promise to you know, make him part of your family, take care of him and give him all the rights of inheritance? Hmm. And we both said, yes, I think, I think you might have said, did you raise your hand and say, I do? I, I think you formalized it somehow. I don't recall. <laughs> that sounds like you. <laughs> um, but anyway, we both obviously agreed and we said yes, but there was just a lot of gravity in that moment. I mean, we really we, felt it. Yeah. We had already committed to him, yeah. of course, but there was something about that, that, um, it had already been a year and a half process almost yeah, by that point. Yeah. It's not like he knew any different, but, um, that was, it was wonderful for us to have that moment to make it official and to, um, to, to agree and to say yes. And so just to see in that same way that God has said yes to us and, and, and brought us. In. Yeah. And in this scenario, God is declaring us to be equal heirs with Christ, which is a pretty um, big deal. <laughs> and obviously we are not as believers. We're still human beings. We are not equal to the person of Christ. We are not an equal part of the Trinity, but God desires for us to have an equal share in the blessings of heaven and the blessings of his presence and whole oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So, and, and there is honestly a part of that verse that does confuse me. The part about sharing in his sufferings. I don't, I, this is one of the things that I would ask Brian if he were here. Um, yeah. Where is that guy? <laughs> maybe I should email him later, <laughs> but, um, I don't understand. I don't know if that actually means just because we live on earth and we suffer mm. and that happens. I probably shouldn't be speculating about that. Um, but either way, we're in it with Christ. Yeah. And so that's the thing that gives in me for comfort. a penny and for a pound. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, point two, I go to Kristen. Kristen, tell us. Well, this process has taught us um, to view adoption as yet another metaphor for the way God pursues us, for his active pursuit of us. And the Bible is full of metaphors for um, God reaching out to us and being the first one to initiate um, making us part of his family. And you know, we could talk a little bit about metaphors, too, and just how it's so hard for us as finite humans to understand God. And so he gives us all these metaphors through scripture mm -hmm. as a way to try and to, through the way Jesus taught. Specifically. Yeah. Yeah. To, to try to help us understand. And he has to give us a lot yeah. <laughs> because we need a lot of help. And so, you know, when we were talking about this earlier, we were talking about Jesus's parables, mm -hmm. right? The parable of the lost coin, um, the lost sheep and both of those cases and the stories um, the shepherd and the woman are actively searching for um, these things that they're missing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's part of the, the active pursuit coming in. And then also like throughout scripture, God is referred to as the bridegroom um, pursuing the bride, the church. And, and by the way, if, if you're not acquainted with any adoptive parents, uh, it's, you might not be aware of what an intentional process it has to be. Right. Yeah. Adoption is very, very deliberate, very intentional. You don't just wake up one morning and realize, oh, I adopted yesterday. How did that happen? Man, what a wild night I had last <laughs> night. Yeah. yeah. It's, you, it, it requires a plan and it requires a lot of time. Um, it involves and months of paperwork, lots of classes, strangers coming and scrutinizing your lives. 
um, coming to your house and inspecting your house, it's a pretty big deal as far you as have all to that get goes. Licensed with. Uh, did you already say this? No. CPR training and yeah. first aid training. Fingerprinted. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. you have to do that for a lot of jobs too, but. Yeah. Um, but I mean, obviously it doesn't hold a candle to the very intentional process God put himself through to become our adoptive father. Right. I mean, he had to take the entirety of the might and majesty of heaven and squash it into the form of an infant. And that was the first step. <laughs> Just um, the first. Yeah. Yeah. He put up with all the indignity and misery of being a human mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when he didn't have to have all those limitations. Right. He took them on yeah. willingly. And he lived that life and a lot, that's a lot bigger deal than just filling out paperwork. Mm -hmm. Um, And then of course he willingly experienced death. Mm -hmm. So all of that, and that's just, you know, we're scratching the surface here, all of that to make us part of his family. Mm. Uh, So, and you know, God also made us. So that's where the metaphor does break down a bit. But when we went our own way, when we went away from him, he deliberately made this plan to bring us back. Which again, you know, when, when we compare ourselves to God in this scenario, because we are the adoptive parents of David, more than anything else, it's humbling. Yeah. Yeah. Just to see how much he did and how he did it all perfectly. And we just <laughs> kind of fumble our way. We don't have a perfect day. <laughs> Never. <laughs> yes. But the, the verse that um, stood out to me for this point um, is in Ephesians. It's chapter one, verse five. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Mm. Just to go through all of that. <laughs> he didn't do it grudgingly or like, yeah. well, I might as well just you know, grin and bear it and become a human. Calling you his son or his daughter was an idea that gave him great joy to pursue. E. I like it. He decided it in advance, and yeah. then he made it happen. Does that bring us to point three? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Point three is is my favorite of the three, and it's instead of what the adoption process taught us about, you know, God being our adoptive father, um, I'm calling this one what Dave, David taught me about being adopted by God. Um, and for this one, it is the unironic way that we should accept our status as God's heirs. I I always felt very awkward about referring to him as my son. And it wasn't because I didn't want to, it was because I felt presumptuous. Um, You know, like, I I felt that was a, a pleasure and a privilege to have that title that I, you know, in a lot of ways didn't earn. Um, But the thing that made it so much easier for me to accept that is the unironic way he calls me daddy. Yes. And Kristen, you've been here many times when I come home from work and sometimes he just explodes into the room when he sees me, he grabs me by the leg and he says, daddy, 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 literally like 14 or 15 times. Oh yes. And I'm like, Hey, I'm glad to see you too, but I'd like to put my bags down. And you know, we reached this point really pretty early in our relationship with him. Um, you know, maybe when we'd had him for a year, yeah. but long before the adoption was finalized, where it was like, okay, there is no irony in this kid's mentality when he refers to us as mom and dad. For him, it is an absolutely real thing. And gosh, darn it, it should be real for me too, to say that. And it, it is real. It has become real. But I also think about that, you know, that is a lesson for me. I mean, Jesus in his teaching talked about how we need to adopt the mindset of a child in, in very mm-hmm. specific ways. And, and I think this is one of them. Um, many believers like me that were raised with somewhat of an I am scum mentality when it comes to, you know, accepting the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, have difficulty with this idea. But when God calls us his children, and we've read these passages where he says it over and over through his word, we really need to take him at his word. Exactly. Yeah. And it isn't, I'm trying to think this through here. God is the one bestowing worth on us. Mm. So that is where the comparison ends. <laughs> Falls apart. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, because our son has worth that has nothing to do with us. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but God is the one bestowing worth on us. And so we, res- we can respond to that and we can live within that gratefully. Mm-hmm. And we know that we are his children and, and that's kind of our starting point. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. He's made up his mind and it's not our job to tell him that he made a mistake. It's our job to say, thank you. I accept and just live in that joy. Yes. So if you are listening to this podcast and you have been saved by the grace of God, that is something that I think we have a responsibility to own. That is a joy that he wanted us to inhabit with our lives. That is one part of heaven that we don't have to wait for death to experience, but to enjoy the knowledge that God looked at us from across time and space and said, I want that one. And because of that, we get to call the God of the universe who created everything We get to call him dad. And that's really special. One last word before we go. So that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us, Kristen. Thank you so much for doing this with me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, but this was a a special effort on your part to commit it to tape. Yes, I'm not a talker. We'll just put it that way. (laughs) She much prefers to read. Yes. (laughs) Um... So I mentioned in the announcements segment, but I want to remind you, if you are listening to this podcast, the day it comes out Thursday, then tomorrow night, Friday night, October, what would that be? Ninth. Ninth. Um, we have a movie night on campus at Centenary, but we, we definitely hope to see you there. And on Sunday, the 11th, we are having a night of worship that I mentioned earlier. It's modern worship this time, but two weeks from then on October 25th, there will be an, uh, an evening hymn sing. And uh, details for both of those things will be on the Centenary Church website, specifically centenarychurch.net slash sky songs. So, hope to see you there. Grateful you joined us. Peace. Bye. Bye. I w- I'm waving again. She's, she is. <laughs> Oops. <laughs>